Hello and welcome to this week's edition of MindWeb.com's Gold Weekly Podcast. My name is Jeff Candy and joining me live from the Johannesburg studio is Julian Phillips. He's the founder of Gold Forecaster. Julian, thank you for joining us. It's my pleasure. We're seeing a lot of... Well, chaos, I suppose, is a, is a kind way of putting it going on in Europe at the moment. There's a lot of toing and froing between Angela Merkel and Nicolas Sarkozy and the rest of the European Union leaders trying to sort out basically the future of the euro and the future of the eurozone. They made a commitment to have a deal done by the end of the month. It looked likely to happen. It looks slightly less likely now, given what we saw over the weekend. What is your view and, and what is it likely to mean for gold prices? I think we've moved to it. Uh, a point in uh, the financial markets of the developed world where um, we could see a massive breakdown or a reassurance that will uh, make markets soar. Uh, Angela Merkel, the concept of a politician now deciding the fate of uh, future uh, financial um, patterns is really frightening in itself because there's a major conflict of interest and where the joining of these two forces has uh, been a source of worry since the credit crunch uh, and particularly so in the eurozone in the last 18 months and they still haven't reached a decision but they promised us that decision and the markets are now ready for it if it doesn't come i can only see turmoil uh, and uh, confusion and and very likely breakdown. If they do reach a conclusion, then watch all financial markets, including the precious metal markets, soar. Why? Because there's a reassurance that the uh, your me your measures of value and your means of exchange appear to be on track together. I don't think they are, but that'll be the appearance, and people will trust the euro a little bit more. And in so being reassured, investors will have more confidence in actually going out there and investing. But at the moment, if they fail, investors will stand back on the sidelines in fear, waiting to see which way things go. And that's why we'll see some horrendous uh, volatility. Mm. If they do reach an agreement, but, but it's perhaps not what markets are looking for, will we reach some unhappy middle ground, do you think? I think at first the breakdown of confidence will be really destructive. Um, I think that the whole world will now watch t to see what financial tsunami comes out of it all. I don't think Greece will uh, fall. Um, I believe they are being given the next tranche, and I believe that the, uh, a solution will be found for them. But imagine for a second that they were not to get there. What alternatives? For the euro to retain any form of confidence, they will have to ask Greece to leave. Greece will then be forced into a, um, a two-tier drachma, uh, one to hold back capital from fleeing the country, and the other to try and keep a semblance of orderliness in the foreign exchange through a sort of commercial drachma. Um, but this is, this is protectionist policies, and uh, it could so easily spread if uh, the banks are, uh, raise the alarms, and the banking system itself will, will, will contract terribly, and that will hamper investors' ability to in invest. Nothing to do with the fundamentals of precious metals, but to do with the state of the investor. Mm. In terms of that and, and, and looking at the, the notion of, of the safe haven qualities of gold, a lot of commentators have said, well, why isn't gold higher than it is given the, the, the turmoil that we're, we're seeing at the moment? What, what is holding it back? Um, well, two things. The nature of the investor, um, whether it be a central bank or an Asian investor, is a slow accumulation of gold as in line with his savings. For the central bank, as the volume is offered, so they'll take it. They won't chase prices. Uh, they won't follow them. They'll just wait for the offer of volumes, and they'll take what volumes are offered to them. The price then becomes a secondary factor because they don't buy to make a profit. They buy for uh, that rainy day. So now that's on the east side of the world and the central banking side of the world. Look westward, what have you got? You've got enough speculative surf on the shores of the markets to create this turmoil we're seeing at the moment. And conservative investors tend to hold back and take advantage of, of that turmoil where they can. So I would take one's focus off the gold price per se and look at the accumulation of uh, gold by the big players. And that is a sort of tidal effect. And you won't see it in the waves, but you will see it over time, as we've seen since the year 2005 in particular. Mm. I know at that time and, and sort of toward 06, 07, 
there was a lot of talk about the fact that gold prices gone ha- gold prices had gone up on the back of investment buying and when that came off there was a doubt as to whether or not the, the the likes of the East and the jewelry buyers could come back into the market in sufficient volumes to maintain those prices. That seems now an outdated argument, but are we likely to see investment demand coming off at all? From the East, from the emerging world and from central banks, no, I don't think so. I, I, I don't think it's got anything to do, as I say, with the price. It's in their culture in the East. They buy gold for financial security. Fathers give it to their daughters in India for financial security. So the price per se is irrelevant. Western investment demand is a peculiar animal because it's a profit profit orientated um, um, item. And if you look at George Soros's behavior, he's typical of the uh, Western concept of investing. He bought the gold bullion, then he switched into uh, gold shares. He's there, but he doesn't make a big fuss of it. But he thinks in terms of profit in dollars, not in terms of holding gold against any eventual breakdown. He was holding it against deflation, uh, not against inflation. He might well come back to the market if these talks break down now because deflation will certainly be back on the table. Hmm. Uh, In terms of these talks, it it has, I suppose, given the U.S. a bit of a reprieve from the the, the focus of the world because clearly there are some significant problems still in the U.S. as well that I think we've potentially forgotten about just a little. Yes, and I think that, uh, to be quite frank, what the euro is going through now is what the U.S. will go through some way down the road. They have the advantage of fiscal union. They have the disadvantage of an emasculated uh, government. And uh, while that persists, uh, how can one have faith in the dollar? But it's the means of exchange. It's the way you pay for oil. And as such, it's the tree trunk of the entire currency system. So it will continue to stand as a means of exchange, not as a measure of value. And the measure of value concept is the one that gold will follow. And I have no doubt that at some time in the near future, as we see gold being pulled in to the system by commercial banks and by emerging um, central banks, that there will be a time when they'll have to reconsider the concept of bringing gold back into reserves in the developed world. And the concept of confiscation will, will rise from the ashes as uh, we saw it in 1933. Don't be surprised if, as a basis uh, for collateral for international dealings, gold becomes as desirable as it was then. Mm. Uh, Julian, to play, devil's advocate, to, to play devil's advocate for a second, there seem to be a very large number of positive boosting factors, I suppose, for, for the gold price over the longer term. What could lead it to come down? I think this investor meltdown is the biggest danger. I think the very contraction of uh, banking, they talked about two, two trillion euro contraction of European banks over the next few years in line with new regulations. I think the concept of leveraging your investments will, will quickly fade uh, as investors become fearful of just what lies ahead. I think that's the biggest danger. Again, nothing to do with the gold's fundamentals, but to do with a developed world, a change of culture from debt-related profit-making to the old-fashioned conservative one. Just as they won't buy shares for capital gain per se, they'll look for dividend, for cash flow, and then justify a capital gain through um, the the payment of uh, shareholders. The shareholder and the investor is going to become the focal point of the shape of the markets in the developed world, I believe, not uh, the fundamentals that played such a rosy part uh, in past days. Mm. What does that mean for gold shares, which have traditionally traded at quite a significant premium to the rest of the market, but have significantly lagged the, the bullion price of late? Well, I think investors have got to decide, are you going to just invest in a miner who likes mining? Are you going to invest to get a total return, which is dividends plus um, uh, capital gain? And I see, as I just said, dividends playing a key part in capital appreciation, far more than they've done. Going back 20, 30 years, you will look at your, your dividend yield, compare it to the fixed interest rate yield, and you've got to justify your P ratios and your dividend uh, ratios in terms of future payment. You've got to have a good reason for going out on a risk as opposed to going into a fixed interest item. And 
mining houses will have to justify mm. uh, investors' uh, hopes. Uh, how much of that has to do with the fact that you can now just buy bullion via the likes of an ETF or, or a coin or, or that kind of thing? I think a huge amount of uh, the money that used to go into mining shares has switched over to, to directly into bullion. You lose a corporate risk. You lose the day-to-day -day troubles that ail so many companies and to be sitting with a gold which is not only uh, an asset but it's actually international cash. This is the ultimate safe haven because it removes the risks whereas mining shares still carry them and, and that's why I think you've seen a major division between the performances. Mm. We are seeing the quarterlies beginning to come through from the gold shares. What are you expecting and, and are you likely to see a re-rating do you think? I think, yes, I think people are going to be very pleasantly surprised with uh, what's coming through. But as I say, I think they're going to look to see how they as shareholders will be rewarded by the mining companies. If they're not, then watch those prices lag. Mm. Julian, just to, to close off with it, then, if we take what you've said about uh, what's been going on in Europe, what's been going on in the US as well, how do you see... Um, I suppose, at one level, the race to the bottom in terms of currencies and, and what that means for, for gold? I think we're, we're, we're at almost a watershed. I mean, do you price gold? Uh, is, is the dollar price really the price of gold or is uh, the, the, the gold the price of the dollar? And that is uh, at a, a, a seesaw tipping point. Do you trust the dollar in terms of that value? I don't think people do. I think there's been such damage to confidence that what has been a major underlying trend will continue in terms of gold rising worldwide. Because now it's a global item, whereas uh, 10 years ago, it's very much a developed world item. Mm. What, do you, what do you make of wh where the gold-silver ratio is at this stage? And, and is it something you follow? Yes, uh, th that is something that frightens the life out of me at the moment because if I look at my um, my particular favorite charts, uh, silver, unless it holds tight to this relationship with gold, looks horrendous. Uh, gold looks far better on the same basis. Um, but nevertheless, I think silver will be the long shadow of gold for a long time to come. And because of its monetary value, you might well see it overcoming this uh, recent meltdown and uh, its prospects being far, far greater than gold itself mm. in the years to come. Why do you say it looks horrendous if, if it doesn't do that? Technically, simply, technically, you know, it's had such a, s a spectacular rise in the shape of its chart, a lot of gaps. Mm -hmm. So it could easily rush down to fill those gaps, but that doesn't detract from its good fundamentals. Julian Phillips is the founder of Gold Forecaster. And that's it for this week's edition of MindWeb.com's Gold Weekly Podcast. From me, Jeff Candy, thanks for listening. And please join us again next week.